Okay, let's see if we can walk this uh, trois crayon drawing forward. Um, and so I'm working in this, this uh, historical tradition of three colors, uh, or trois crayons. Uh, and we're working with an earth red, a black, and a white on a toned paper. Um, it's something we see Rubens do a lot of, and, and probably better than anyone. And typically Rubens will work on sort of a tan, uh, cream colored paper. I'm working on a bluish gray paper here which is from Zirkel German Angra. It's, it's Zirkel German Angra is the paper. Um, the, the figure has been transferred onto the paper. Um, a preliminary line drawing was made first in graphite and then uh, transferred as a cartoon onto the paper using red chalk. So the next steps uh, have been to poster in the shadow shapes. Uh, so all of the uh, shadow shapes have been um, postered in with this Pit Pastel, Faber-Castell Pit Pastel Pencil. Uh, this is the number 188, so it's sort of a Tuscan red. Um, and I basically poster in my shadow shapes by, by hatching them in um, with little hatches off the tip of the chalk pencil. And then I um, homogenize that with a bristle brush, a small bristle brush that I've, that I've uh, designated as a, as a red chalk brush. And then I'll go back and, and uh, make another pass of hatching on top of that, filling in the grain a little bit more, since the paper has a nice grain to it. Uh, and then once again, um, filling in the grain of that with the brush, so homogenizing out the poster shape. And we're just looking for one flat uh, poster value right now. It doesn't need to be tonally variated, so there's, there's no need to show variations in value from dark to light when we're just postering as we are in this area of the figure here. You can see the head has been more completed in rendering, and we can start to see some of the rationale behind the trois crayon, which is uh, um, that the, we, have, we have the ability to represent dark values and light values between white chalk and the red and the black, which cover the dark values. Um, and we also have the ability to show changes in warm and cool temperatures of color. So um, simply put, anything that feels that it is in the hue or appears to be in the hue of yellow, orange, or red, um, browns, these things are warm. And anything that looks to us on our model in the hue of, of blue or colder grays uh, or black would be considered cold. So we'll use, we'll use the black charcoal to represent uh, cold temperatures, like the shadow under the beard here looks very uh, bluish gray to me when I look at the model. And also passages in his mustache and beard feel that, that same temperature. And anything that feels warm, like the hot red passages on his cheeks, um, the shadow masses in the, the shadow mass shapes in the eye sockets are very dark uh, red as, as they are on the bottom of the nose. So we'll try to lean on the red chalk uh, more for that. Um, we can look at Rubens as kind of a, um, uh, a guidebook to how to use red, black, and white charcoal, and, uh, or I should say chalk. But, but uh, basically what he does is he, he will mix the red and the black together, and I'm doing that in some passages here, like on the side of the face, a little bit of black to deepen the value with the red. Uh, in the nostrils, I'm got, kind of going back and forth between black and red together. So you can mix the black and the red together, but um, it basically there's no mixture of the black and the white, and there's no mixture of the red and the white. And, and uh, so it's an interesting philosophy to try to juggle. All right, let's, let's see if we can um, start to get some of the forms in the torso to turn. It's a little bit hard. I'm working with uh, the, the famous uh, uh, John Carrasco, who's a wonderful model here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, that has been drawn by so many artists and appreciated by so many artists. And he's posing in this really amazing, um, uh, this sort of uh, St. Bartholomew-esque pose for me. Um, and, and heavily foreshortened. Um, but one thing about John is he is heavily tattooed. So there's a lot of tattoos on the torso here that are um, confusing the form for me. So I'm going to try to see through those and just try to see back to the raw form. Um, what I like to do is um, establish the highest lights first. So I'm going to go ahead and lay in the highlight on the stomach and really go for the shape of the highlight. So I'm trying to be hard on myself about the position of this light shape 
uh, and also its its uh, its specific shape as we sort of lightning bolt our way through the form here. And uh, it's important to to be um, really descriptive about your your especially your highlight shapes because they uh, they're very very often casually tossed around by the student. I notice a lot of my students will just um, slap down a highlight, it'll end up in the wrong place and it won't be the right shape either. So uh, I like to establish my highlights first um, because they help me set the key for the rest of the form so that I can start to understand surrounding this where I can just let the paper show through and then at, at where I need to deepen the value. And uh, he has a highlight moving up uh, the whole torso here that's going to span into the pectoralis major muscle. One thing that's important to do whenever you're making a, um, a multi-chalk drawing, uh, even if it's just black and white chalk, is uh, prepare the path for the white chalk. So you'll notice I just lifted off um, and cleaned off this area with, with a visit from the kneaded eraser. And that's because if there was any residue there of black charcoal or white or, or uh, red chalk, um, we would see a mixture occur. We'd see the white appearing either in kind of a smoky blue appearance if it mixes with the with the black charcoal, or it turns into a, a, a kind of a salmon pink color if we mix it with um, with the red chalk. And it, and it basically is is unattractive, unappealing looking in the drawing. So we're trying to. Um, we're trying to uh, keep the white isolated uh, in this drawing. And you'll notice as I hatch the white on, I, I think about um, staying on the form. So the hatches are, are lines that travel in a cross contour manner. They, they, they travel across the surface and ostensibly they, they describe sculpture. They describe the turning form of the body. So I'm slowly branching out from my highlight and um, carefully assessing values that could be brought up close to the highlight or at least in the family of using white chalk. I'm trying to discriminate areas where the white chalk should definitely appear and also areas where um, the white should be used in a very uh, light, moderate way um, and also areas where I shouldn't be using the white. I think that's an important question that I see escape a lot of people as they start to just use the white chalk uh, through anything, anything which is illuminated, they begin to use the white chalk everywhere. And remember that a lot of areas in the light mass um, are, are beautifully and wonderfully approximated and represented by, by the paper itself. So for a more masterful appearance in the drawing, we want to make sure that paper can appear um, just clean, untouched paper. Sometimes you, you can achieve that by erasing back out to the paper, but we definitely want the paper to function as part of the, uh, as an operative value in turning the form. So we want to give the paper the opportunity to do that. Once we start mixing the chalks everywhere and creating values by mixed chalks, we're really not in the realm of a, of a chalk drawing anymore. We're really doing a full pastel, full color painting. And that's fine, but um, we'd want a broader palette and, and we're probably gonna obliterate the paper, uh, at least the value and the color of the paper. Okay, so we're, we're getting some of our higher lights happening here. Um, there's a moment here where the costal arch of the rib cage comes up pretty high uh, because of the foreshortened nature of the pose. I'm actually getting a little bit of rib cage showing up here. So notice my hatches are traveling across the form. Um, and it seems like I have a little bit of light up on the pectoralis. And I'll remind you, I'm kind of, I'm looking through his tattoos and I'm trying to just read what the raw form would be without the tattoo in the way. It's often a good thing to do for the artist to just look at the um, what, what the 
what the simple facts are of the pose and, and its relationship to the light source. And so we can see based on the direction of the, the cast shadows and the way they fall, um, we can see that uh, he's being illuminated uh, from this direction. Uh, and and um, John posed for the uh, for a video recording of this pose. So I'm working from a video recording uh, of him in the pose. So I'm, as I look at him in the pose, I can see him um, breathing and blinking his eyes, and uh, uh, the the pose wavers here and there as he as he struggles to hold the pose. So I'm trying to simulate the um, experience of having him hold this pose from life. But he was outside in my garden behind my studio, um, lit up by the sun. So the sunshine was coming in this upper side angle. Okay, so we're starting to turn the volume a little bit. Uh, I like to uh, hatch on my, my chalks, and then I like to work them out a little bit with a brush. So I'm using a small, small bristle brush here that I keep... Uh, specifically for white chalk. If you try to blend your white chalk with a brush that you've used for black or red or any other color, then you're going to start to, um, you're going to dirty that color. So I, I often go back and forth between blending and hatching. Uh, you can see that the, the French artist uh, Pierre-Paul Proudhon, um, a lot of his drawings, has they have unfinished areas. And you can see the process he's gone through. And it, it seems that what he often does is he'll hatch on the white uh, in a very almost crisscross tic-tac-toe manner uh, across the form, just trying to establish where the whites will go. And then you can see in more finely finished passages of his drawings, he's blended that out completely and then re-rendered with new hatches on top of that. And, and Proudhon, actually, you can see in his drawings, will mix the black and the white together. He'll interweave hatches of black and white. And that's something that, that I don't do, but it, he, he makes it work amazingly. Okay, so we've worked out the white on the form. We're starting to get a little bit of turning volume in, uh, in the chest. So now it's time to start to look and turn to our darker values. And that's where we're going to use our red chalks and our black charcoal. And we have to start to discriminate here between what's warm and what's cool. And um, one of the first places I'm going to start here uh, is right at the terminator edge on the side of the rib cage. I'm going to create uh, a core shadow edge. So core shadow edge is, is uh, a deepened, darkened area of value just behind the terminator of the shadow edge. And the reason for its existence is that there is simply always going to be less reflected light present. The least amount of reflected light present will be, will be, um, will occur directly behind the terminator edge. So here's the terminator edge where the light terminates. Immediately behind that edge is a zone where we have the least presence of reflected light. And these areas will always have more reflected light in them, even if they're very minimal. Um, so I start to hatch in the core shadow and I'll even run the tone past the terminator a little bit into what we call half light, where the light rays are tangent to the form, just to soften that edge a little bit. Now, I'm not going to do that in an area where there's a cast shadow, because cast shadows are sharp. Uh, but there is a, a deepened value here. So I'm using, I'm using a darker red chalk, just full disclosure here. I'm, I'm, I'm breaking the historical rules a little bit. And that I've got two chalks going on. Let me address that now. So I do have, I have a, a Faber Castell Pit Pastel number one eighty eight. Uh, you can see the little number hiding inside the the holder there, number one eight eight. And then I have a Faber Castell Pit Pastel. This is a number one nine two. It's a little bit more of a darker Venetian red. So it's I'm leaning on that to access a little bit of the darker values in the red. That's one thing about a red chalk drawing is that the um, the red chalk is not going to be as dark as black charcoal, so we, we have to learn to adjust our value range. But if we're doing a trois crayon drawing, we, we have unlimited access here uh, to full, deep, darkened values. So I'm putting in the core shadow as I go down the bicep here. In a form like the bicep, the core shadow might look just like um, a little bit of a ribbon stripe running 
down the length of the bicep. And it's going to vary in width as the bicep either tightens in curvature or broadens in curvature. It's important not to make a pin stripe out of the core shadow, um, but something that is integrated into the, the whole shadow shape behind it. And it's fine to work back and forth with your blending tool. I'm using a brush. Uh, blend it out and then hatch it again if you'd like. Now, um, a, a wonderful place to find cool temperatures in the figure is right in the zone of the half light. So where the light is starting to um, lose its strength and impact the form. Um, in flesh, we typically see that the the value of the light is darkening to the darkest value that it can be and still be considered light mass because these areas are scientifically illuminated by light. But um, what happens in flesh, um, due to the, the raking angle of the light, um, the semi-transparency of the flesh itself, and the presence of... Um, the presence of, of hairs on the uh, growing out of the surface of the flesh, we get a cool temperature in the half light. So it's a great formulaic um, approach to painting flesh is that we want to look at that half light as a cool temperature. Meanwhile, the shadow mass will be warm. But I'm hatching in with the black charcoal, uh, just a cool temperature. So if it's black, will be cool. And I'm looking at the values present on the model and I'm trying to um, trying to turn the form. Um, I can leave that as is or if I feel needed, I feel if I feel it's needed, I can uh, I can uh, blend that out with the brush a little bit. One thing I'm wary of in working with a, a, a charcoal pencil, I find this true for all charcoal pencils. Um, this happens to be a Wolf's Carbon. Um, it's a B. Uh, so it's, it's the, I think it's the hardest one that they offer, but um, I noticed that anytime we're blending a, uh, a charcoal pencil, it, it's going to end up getting a little bit darker after you pass over it with your blending tool. So there it goes. It's getting darker. So I try to sneak up on it when I'm hatching it on um, t because I know I'm probably going to blend it and uh, it's probably going to then be too dark. So that one worked out okay. But um, you can revisit it with the Anita eraser and adjust adjust the value. Just light scathing of the eraser to try to soften the value a little bit. And uh, we can come back to that a couple more times if we need to. Uh, I see some wonderful darker cool values that occur here uh, on the side of the rib cage and stomach. So I can, I can gently hatch these on. They are cool temperature to my eye. They look very cool and grayish in value. And so I'm, I'm turning the form a little bit with the direction of hatches here. And then uh, as we go around the stomach, um, due to the presence of, of chest hair, uh, body hair, I'm getting cooler temperature defining the form here. But we want to remember that something like this is not a shadow. And there's the pitfall for, for many students, is that they see something that we classify as a dark light. And they assume that just because it's a darker value, that it would in fact be a shadow, which is, which is wrong. And so we want to realize that darker values in the light mass are areas which are still being illuminated by the light source. And so by definition, they are, they are light. They are illuminated by light. Uh, and it would, be, it, would be, it would be a misstep for us to represent them as uh, shadow values. So we're trying to organize um, our depiction of light and shadow here in, in our values. To organize our values means that we're gonna say that no value in the, in the light mass like these ones, no values in the light mass, none of these, not the highlight, not the, not the light light values, not the general light values like here, not the dark light values, not the half light. No value in the in light mass can be as dark as any value in the shadow mass. And 
The reverse is true as well. So we're, we're going to say that no value in the shadow mass can be as bright as any value in the light mass. And that's really um, pinpointing the problem of reflected lights. So a lot of people see a little bit of reflected light in the shadow mass like there, and they, they go hog wild with it. They start to make that, that reflected light, they make it as bright as, um, as some of the brightest lights out in the light mass. So we wanna realize that the reflected light is not real light and that it is um, just a, 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 ref a reflection of light off of another area. And uh, we want it to look like part of the shadow mass. So it, a good tactic with reflected light is represent it as being way darker than you think it is. Now this crease between the torso and the arm, the compression of the side of the, of the inside of the arm, um, I, I'm gonna need to access darker values. So uh, it's something I can, I can go back and forth with between the black and the red chalk. It's, uh, it's somewhere where we probably want it to be a darker value but maybe we want it to be warm because wherever we have flesh pressing against flesh uh, should tilt towards a warm temperature. Um, so I'm going over that black charcoal with the red again and trying to get a nice deep value there. Okay. If you sense areas which are um, neutral, well, your eye, if your eye can't decipher whether it's a cool or a warm, uh, then it's, it's, a, it's a license to um, mix the two if you need to. So that helps me to turn the belly a little bit more right there. And I'm also seeing um, values present on the side of the body that uh, are going to need to be a little darker than the paper. So I'm just going to hatch lightly a little bit of, of the lighter red chalk over that to try to get this to turn, turn down in value. Um, and I'm going to brush that out just to homogenize it let, it, let it sit on the form. Integrate it with the surrounding neighboring tones. both the black and the red going into the navel. You can see a little bit of white in the way. So this is an example of what I was talking about before. If you feel like you need to use a, a passage of red or black in an area where you already have placed some white, just take a second to um, clear out and prepare the way for the addition of that, that chalk. Okay, uh, a little bit of form that I want to capture here is this plane um, sort of spanning between the stomach and the costal arch of the rib cage, and also some turning at the side of the belly, turning away from us. Since the whole torso is ultimately a round thing in the human body, um, it means this edge needs to go that way, this edge needs to come this way.
Okay, we want to get a little bit of structure going on in the underarm area here and side of the chest. Looking at the values that create both the under area of pectoralis, armpit forms, I'm just going to hatch them in in a preliminary way with some of the red chalk. Intermittently, we want to look back at the whole drawing and we want to gauge if, if there's a little bit of light in here, for example, I want to look and see how bright is it compared to there on the model. And so typically when we do that, we realize that the values are, are very different. When we, we think we might have a light here that's maybe the same as over there, uh, we want to make a comparison. Okay, and I'm starting to merge together some of the black and red here in the side upper torso. So we get mixtures of the black and the red. So technically we have a, a neutral temperature whenever we mix warm and cool together. On the body, on the in full color, these colors usually appear to our eyes as something purplish or greenish in terms of flesh tones. And it's interesting if you ask ask different different people what they see in the color in those places. Um, there's usually sort of a, a, a disagreement. One person may say it's greenish, the other person may say it's purple. And I, I often say, well, you're both right because those are both neutral hues. And those are colors that we get simply by mixing a warm and a cool together. So it's an important process, the Trois Crayon, because it, uh, it helps the, the artist to um, bridge this, this world of drawing where we're mostly looking at shape and value. Um, and we're taking a, the first step into the world of, of painting where color comes into play and the first pillar of painting would be temperature. Before we get into color, um, temperature is, is a more important question, I feel. So I ask my students to always analyze when they paint, um, once, they're, once they're beyond the issue of shape, of course, uh, which is most of the, the line drawing and the proportions and structure and, and those kinds of things. Um, once they're beyond shape in any given work, and I asked them to think about value, and they thought about value and managed the values, um, then it's time to think about uh, temperature. And the amazing thing about that, I feel that when we learn to paint that way, uh, is that if we, if we get the color, if we get the value right, and we get the temperature right, the color, can do whatever it wants, really. And I think the painter can kind of let go at that point and not worry about specific hues so much. Um, and just pay attention to value and pay attention to temperature. And we have it, we have our painting. So many of those beautiful Trois Crayon drawings, uh, excuse me, one of the, many of those beautiful Trois Crayon drawings um, that we see by Rubens, and the best one probably of, maybe of all time, is the his portrait of Isabella Brandt, his second wife. Um, no, I'm sorry, that was his that was his first wife. So um, his portrait of her, um, in in the Trois Crayon technique, um, it's it's really like a textbook lesson in in using warms and cools together in a drawing, but not worrying about color so much. And using the, the kind of paper that he does um, and the red, black, and white chalk, uh, it's almost like he's doing a full color painting.
you can see what happens when I bring the white right up to the edge of the dark there. We develop a corner there. So that's, that's a, a warning to the student is that you need transitional value between your lights and your darks um, if you want to make round form. If you're, if you're trying to make a corner on the form of some kind, um, it's okay to slam the white right up against the darker value. But if you're looking for a, a transition in value, a, a turning in form, a, a sense of roundness, well, that's where we need uh, the paper to be the transitional value between the dark and the light. So I think I was a little bit over enthusiastic early on there in bringing that white way down. So now that I look, I can see the highlight does relegate itself to more of this, this area. Um, I can look to see where, where it is in relationship to the navel and in what shape. So I can see it pretty strongly through here. But then now at, with a second look and seeing with all the other values in context, I can see that it probably should stay, in, at least in terms of its full strength, it should stay in this area to give us a, um, a more even curvature, an even rate of curvature. Yeah. The other thing I notice with this tech, with this process of filming the demonstration is that I get to look through my video camera uh, intermittently and I notice um, it, it works in a couple different ways. It's like a blemish mirror and that it's very unforgiving. The camera is very harsh and everything looks way more contrasted and, and um, intense than what I see on the paper. So it pushes me to try to be even more subtle. Um, but uh, the camera also just shows me a smaller version of my drawing, which is like, which is the equivalent of getting up and backing up, looking at the drawing from a distance, which is a good thing to do if you're in the studio with the model and you're, you're drawing from life and you, um, you need to get up out of your, your chair, or get back away from your easel and look at your drawing from a distance every five minutes as much as you can. And that's, that's the magic wand if we if there is a magic wand to drawing uh, or painting it's getting back and seeing the work from a distance frequently people always want want a, a magic pill or magic wand trick to learn to do something and that's one of them for drawing and painting is back up and the other is squint your eyes squint your eyes as you look at your drawing as much as you can squint when you look at your drawing and squint when you look at your at your model at the same time keep them squinted look back and forth at the model with squinted eyes uh, and you'll catch things that maybe slipped past your your awareness um, you'll notice value patterns and um, that, that you didn't capture or you or you'll notice where you're making a value pattern where there shouldn't be one so squinting and backing up from your work are two major um, uh, magic wands I guess for us to, to draw and paint better. Um, another one that I use a lot is looking in the mirror. And I, I intermittently have a little mirror here um, at the side of the easel, uh, just a small one. And it, I can um, look at my drawing backwards and immediately pop, popping out to my eye will be anything um, that's maybe out of whack structurally. Definitely in portraiture, it really helps. You might notice that you have the eye slightly out of, out of location or you have one side of the mouth too long than the other. Uh, you'll, cap, you'll catch those things before they are cemented in the work. So one of the lovely things about the Toile Crayon is that we, we get the charm of the red chalk, but we don't have the limitations of the value that the red chalk um, usually provides as an obstacle. Usually with red chalk, we, we have to work in a more compressed value range because the red chalk just won't go into the ranges of black charcoal. So now we don't have that limitation. We've got, we've got everything going.
trying to keep some of that paper showing through. So I've got the clean paper is showing up here. In some of these dark passages that look dark, that's actually just the paper. You can see that uh, the white is turning a little bit pink to my eye. I don't think it shows up on the camera, but I'm going to try this again without red chalk dust present. So um, just gently hatching. Yeah, there's red chalk there. So red chalk dust. So the, the white turns a little bit pink, which I don't, I don't want it to have. And again, John's arms are heavily tattooed, and so I have to go a little bit off of memory of, of my awareness of the form of musculature and just simple understandings of how light will bathe the form of a cylinder, of an egg, um, sort of putting the, the, con the logic of light on cylinder and on an egg together can help me to work my way through things like a deltoid and a bicep. And then there's also just the looking at the drawing and seeing what does it look like. Here I'm blending out the white again. Getting it to sit on the form, probably returning again and hatching over it later on. So we're getting some volume out of him now. Um, I think it's, it's always important to not copy uh, from your reference, even if the model's sitting there posing for you um, from life or you're working from a photo or like a, a working from a video recording of the pose like I am. Um, look at the drawing and see what does it need? What is it asking you to do? What is it telling you that it likes or doesn't like? And I think that's, and that's um, works for painting as well. You know, a painting will call out to you and say, it'll tell you, it'll communicate to you. It'll say, I don't like this happening over here. Uh, you, you know what that feels like. You look at something and you thought it was the right thing to do because you saw it. But then you, when you try it, it doesn't feel good. And so you have to listen to the drawing or the painting. So I just look at the drawing. I sort of turn away from the model for sometimes for a while and just work on the, the drawing or the painting itself and see what it needs. I'm trying to listen to the needs of the drawing and the painting itself because we realize that the painting or the drawing is gonna survive um, ostensibly forever or a couple centuries, hopefully. And, uh, and the model's going to not and uh, any record of that, you know, the video, the photograph, or whatever was used to reference. Um, no, no one's really going to care about that anymore. So the artwork transcends and lives on. So we really have to listen to, to it, to the drawing, to the painting. You get, get what it needs. A little bit of the body hair coming up the midline there. I'm just going to try out and see if that helps me uh, to establish a sense of midline. And I also notice a little bit of just the, the impact of the navel being a recession has some effect on the forms to its sides in a, in a cool temperature value. I'm going to put it on and then tap it down into a more subtle state. Very challenging uh, sometimes when men have both chest hair and tattoos. Um, you really have to turn to your, uh, your memory um, and your awareness of form and your study of anatomy to navigate through and your understanding of light on form. 
to make it work because you're 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 in a sort of a minefield of obstacles. And and once again, turning and looking to the drawing and saying, what do, what do you need or what don't you like? What's not working? And taking time to adjust those things. So all throughout this demonstration, you notice I've been switching between red, black, white, eraser. Um, it starts to become like an open palette, you know, that you're shifting between warm and cool in the darks. You're thinking about value. You're trying to see where you can uh, get a good economy of the paper working for you. I'm a big fan of linear work. So when I look at Van Dyke's drawings and Rubin's drawings, um, you can see that they care about the linear quality you know, what kind of line work is used. Um, they, they care about that just as much as they do about the, the tonal work, the fine, fine tonal work that they do. And they almost non-verbally teach us a code about linear work. And I'm not even sure what they're fully thinking about it because they're, they never wrote it down and they're not here to tell us. But what I notice is that they they variate their line work from thin to thick, light to dark, soft to sharp, um, solid to tenuous or broken. Uh, all the different things you could you could think of, and it seems to correlate very much to the kind of form they're drawing. Um, whether it's in shadow, like here, and or whether it's in light, like up here. Um, whether it's soft flesh, like this, um, and this, or maybe it's bone, like this. And um, all the permutations of that, flesh versus bone, Shadow versus light, uh, near versus far, focused versus unfocused. All the permutations of that seem to dictate the quality of line work that they use. And so there's a whole poem there that we could instill in a, in a drawing um, of different behaviors of line work. And I don't think there's a textbook way of doing it. I think, it's, I think ultimately it comes down to the poetic license of the artist to describe the form that they're representing, not only tonally, um, but also in linear manner. And so if you see corrections, if you wanna change the outline of the body to let's say run in here, they put in those statements and those masters certainly did so or retroactively if they discover a, an overlap that they missed, they enter it into the drawing. Um, the pentimenti lines. Pentimenti meaning little repentances, little apologies. You know, if I need to correct this and move this in, I'm just gonna put that new line in and leave the lines, let them stay there. Or maybe they're just searching, maybe we're just searching for where is the edge? And by putting in and reiterating, um, we, can, we can find out where it needs to be. So I think pentimenti lines do have uh, a good use. You know, the artist is searching and they have a charm to them when we leave them as well. This is a shadow shape here coming off the side of the pectoralis. So I need to state it not, not as a, as a as a line, but as a shape. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm sure I'll be working and vi revisiting these passages many times uh, as I continue into the legs and arms. It's natural that when we, we render one thing, 
move into the next area, we see more truth about what we left behind. Uh, and we, we often want to go back to that. So, and hopefully it gets better and better. All right, well, thanks for taking a look and for watching as I work my way through this trois crayon process. And I hope you give it a try sometime.